Good evening. I want to talk with you tonight about the secret to a fulfilled life. God has created every one of us with a, a need to have a relationship with him. And if we don't come to the God of the universe, the, you know, the, the God that is expressed through a personal relationship with Jesus, we will spend a lifetime trying to fabricate our own joy, our own peace. We will seek for other avenues for fulfillment. And the true and living God is the one who created us. And he created us with a need for a relationship with him. And so as I talk about the secret to a fulfilled life tonight, I'm gonna to read from two sections of scripture primarily. And uh, in these scriptures, um, it seems like I've referred to these uh, recently in the last few months, but I, the Lord has brought me back to this. In fact, I'm gonna use an illustration at the end on serving that I just used, I think just a few months ago, but I think it's got some powerful um, illustration for us as far as what it means to be truly fulfilled. The secret to a fulfilled life. First of all, fulfillment comes through fruitfulness that lasts. And in John chapter 15, hours before Jesus is to die on the cross, he's in conversation with the disciples. In fact, it would uh, potentially still be the same scene of the Last Supper. Uh, John 13, John 14, John 15. Here's what Jesus says. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I also abide in you. The translation I'm reading here is remain in me as I also remain in me. But I think the word abide that comes from the earlier translation, the King James translation is a more powerful word. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. So there's a call there for an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, how is your relationship with Jesus? That is the most important relationship you'll have your entire lifetime. And if you don't come to him, you'll spend a lifetime looking for fulfillment and you'll always come up disappointed. Let me continue. Jesus continues in verse five and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then he makes this all important statement. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, let me just pause right there and just say that God has wired every one of us with a need to accomplish things, a need for our life to count. Uh, a need for our life to have meaning. And essentially what he's saying here is, apart from me, you can do nothing. We've been created for accomplishment. We've been created to um, finish tasks and God, God has created within us a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction when we know that we have carried through on a task. But he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's, that's the key to fulfillment is an abiding relationship with Jesus. He goes on and says this, if you do not abide in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Those are poignant words. He goes on and says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And there's that phrase again, that you bear much fruit. Again, we've been created to be fruitful. We've been created to accomplish things. And it's in a personal relationship with Jesus that we find out our true place of assignment, our true place of fulfillment, our true place of contentment. He goes on and says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. And, and again, there's an insight there to the true sense of fulfillment. I've, 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 I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Please Make the connection, tie the word joy to a sense of fulfillment. There is a completeness of joy that as we, as we do the Father's will, there's this place of joy. My command is this, love each other as I love, have loved you. And then he makes this statement, verse 13, 
Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Now here's a key verse. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So therefore, that's why my first point, my first point here is fulfillment comes through fruitfulness that lasts. Jesus, hear the words of Jesus when he says, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. He gives insight to us as far as what's going to last forever, what's going to count. And it has everything to do with abiding in Christ. And from that abiding in relationship with Jesus, he guides us and leads us to help others to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And he challenges us by his Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, to share the good news with other people. So fulfillment comes first through fruitfulness that lasts. And that fruitfulness has to do with people and the effect that you have on people. The second thing is this, fulfillment comes through reaping the right harvest. There's a lot of people that in, if they don't come to Jesus, if they don't have a relationship with Jesus, they will spend a lifetime trying to pursue a life of fulfillment through whether it's the God of materialism, the idol of, of pleasure, which would be hedonism in our American lifestyle, uh, there's a lot of people that will place value on certain things and uh, hedonism is a big one because we tend to be selfish here in America. We want what we want and we want it right now. But fulfillment comes through reaping the right harvest. And in this point, I'm drawn to the story in John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, where Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon, it was about midday. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to, him, said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. It's almost like Samaritans were uh, considered less than the Jews because of their heritage. Um, uh, maybe a, a negative term would be half-breed where Samaritans were partly Jew, but partly Gentile. And uh, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to her, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, and you can just well imagine that Jesus, with great compassion and with a heart filled with peace and compassion says this in the right way. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> she speaks what's obvious. But then she maybe in a moment of being uncomfortable tries to change the subject and he says, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither 
on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, is now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now catch this. He says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And part of what I want to say from that statement is that when Jesus says that to the woman, Jesus is inviting this woman to accept him as the Savior. In fact, the woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And with that exchange between Jesus and the woman, I, I just simply want to say, when Jesus says God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. We live in a wealthy country called America where there's a lot of people that will seek for fulfillment in all the wrong places. And that's where you uh, truly, you can describe it as idolatry. Um, in fact, the Ten Commandments, I believe the first one is thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when people forsake the true and living God that's found in Jesus Christ, they will spend a lifetime trying to find fulfillment through seeking other gods. And whether it's the God of pleasure, the God of materialism, uh, the God of beauty or fame, uh, the God of sports, you know, so many people are into sports these days and I remember picking up some writers that were from Boston and they were big New England Patriot fans and with the thought of losing Tom Brady, they didn't want to lose Tom Brady as their quarterback. They were hoping for at least one more championship and even with six Super Bowl victories from Tom Brady, they wanted, it's, almost, it's true for all of us that we want just a little bit more. We're never satisfied, we're never fulfilled outside of a relationship with Jesus. For those that get obsessed with politics, sometimes politics can become their God. And we live in a country today that's deeply divided. And if you're going to pursue politics as the answer, you're gonna be disappointed. Uh, we have leaders that are flawed, that are imperfect. Um, we, we are to pray for our presidents. We're to pray for our government. But uh, the past president was flawed. He was imperfect. The new president will be imperfect. But if you are so obsessed about politics that it becomes your God, then you're going to be disappointed. The only place of fulfillment, the only answer for our country is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus says God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth, what I want to tie in for us as Americans is that if we don't come to the true and living God and worship him and put him first in our lives, then by default, we will put other things first in our lives and we will be disappointed. Politics, that's not the answer. The former president was not a savior. The new president isn't going to be a savior. We only have one savior and his name is Jesus. He is the savior of the world and there's only a place of fulfillment in following Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with him where we tie into his presence and he gives us a sense of assignment, a sense of fulfillment with the promise of his presence. There is no lasting fulfillment outside of a personal relationship with Jesus. Let's continue with the story. The disciples come back. They rejoin Jesus. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the, the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? Then Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop 
for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Catch again the words of Jesus. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he says, lift up your eyes. The, the fields are white unto harvest. There's a great harvest awaiting us. And I want to say to you, the secret to fulfillment is in reaping the right harvest. There are a lot of people who are pursuing fulfillment through trying to reap the wrong harvest. The only right harvest is coming to Jesus and letting him give us a sense of assignment as far as helping others to come to Jesus, to preach the gospel, to disciple others, and to, when I think of what Jesus said to the disciples at one point, giving, he sent them out and he said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Jesus, at one point in the gospel, said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And with that, I want to use this story again. Famous model, Carrie Otis, was among the world's top supermodels for 17 years, beginning her career at the age of 14. To prepare for each photo shoot, she, would routine, routinely, she routinely binged and purged, took laxatives and diet pills and exercised intensely. Being extremely thin made it possible a modeling career that earned her $20,000 a day. $20,000 a day. J just think about that for a moment. What you could do with $20,000 a day. And again, I want to say that in a country where we are so blessed and so wealthy, $20,000 a day, just from this story, you could say that there's the God of materialism, the God of beauty, the God of fame, the God of wealth, the God of hedonism. Um, cocaine helped carry to diet and she used heroin later on in her career. She married actor Mickey Rourke, but they soon divorced. This destructive lifestyle led to a mental and emotional breakdown for Carrie. After treatment at a mental institution, she emerged committed to changing her life. She began eating normally and abstaining from all drugs and alcohol. She gained 30 pounds, went from a size two to a size 12, and is now successful as a plus size model. This was written years ago, and now Carrie is probably in her 50s, but last year on her 32nd birthday is when this was read, a friend invited her on a humanitarian mission to distribute clothes and toys to kids living in orphanages in Nepal. For the first time, she saw what starvation really was. Looking back on her experience, she explained to reporter Cynthia McFadden, it wasn't about somebody being concerned that they were going to fit into a size and that's why they weren't eating. It was because there wasn't food to be had. There was no money to get food. I thought, you know what? This is how the rest of the world lives. If somebody asked me, when did you feel the most beautiful? I would say when I was traveling through the Himalayas in dirty clothes, dirty hair, hadn't had a shower in a week and was giving kids clothes. That's when I felt like the most beautiful woman and the woman I've always aspired to be. True fulfillment comes when we give of our lives to Jesus and when we lay our lives down for other people. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And the best gifts that you can give to people is the gift of Jesus. True fulfillment comes through fruitfulness that lasts. And that fruitfulness can only come from an abiding relationship with Jesus. Hear the words again. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing in this life that you will ever do outside of abiding relationship with Jesus will not stand the test of time. It will not last forever. It's only what you do for Jesus. Fulfillment comes through fruitfulness that lasts. And fulfillment comes through reaping the right harvest. What is it that you're reaping these days? It's only in an abiding relationship with Jesus that we will have a life that counts and that we will find the true place of fulfillment. The secret to fulfillment is in a relationship with Jesus, abiding in him, giving ourselves to spending time in prayer, letting him speak to us through the eternal word of God, and then pouring our lives out 
in service to others, helping people to come to Jesus. That's the true place of fulfillment. Let's pray and ask God to seal this to our hearts. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking words to us that echo through the centuries. Thank you, Lord, that you laid your life down for us and that you help us today. We're reminded from your words in John 15 that apart from you, we can do nothing. Help us to see that that abiding relationship with you, Jesus, is available to us each day. Help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can walk with you and abide in you. And as we do that, that you give us a sense of assignment with the promise of your presence. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to find that place of fulfillment in putting you first in our lives and in putting you first you show us how to serve others. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. In your strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great weekend. I, I, I pray and hope that you find the, the secret to fulfillment.